All right, guys. Imagine that. It is another gray, gloomy, sticky day here in the collapse of everything. Although it looks like we have a ray of sunshine here for the... Well, so much for our ray of sunshine. I guess we're in the middle of yet another flash flood watch. The third flash flood watch in 15 days here at Bugs in a Jar Farm. And uh, I need to go do the laundry pile from hell here on this uh, soon to be stormy. Wow, raining in New York. Soon to be stormy Sunday afternoon here at Bugs in a Jar Farm in the collapse of everything. It is Sunday, August 18th, 2024. So guys, I have been, uh, as I was saying yesterday, on a William Reese binge. Uh, as Gloria Nanati says, I snort Bill Reese uh, videos. So Bill Reese you know, I admit, uh, he, he's got his shtick down, uh, and his interviews sound pretty much the same, but it doesn't, you can pretty much throw a dart, you can watch the one right here uh, on Collapse Chronicles, uh, or any other one, and you will find that William Reese understands and is able to articulate uh, the state of this planet in 2024 and where we are going as a civilization and a planet over the next uh, few years to decades. Um, but between his YouTube interviews, he still manages to sit down and, and write uh, basically a thousand variations on a theme of of why we are so fucked. And once again, I want to thank Medium.com's Eric Lee uh, for uh, bringing this article to our attention. So this one snuck by me in resilience.org somehow uh, from July 11th. So it's, it's a month old now, but uh, I assure you, Everything in this article uh, is more true now than it was a month ago. So, uh, I'm going to read about half of this article. I'm going to put the link on here for you to read the rest of it. But uh, I do want to warn you, you have to sign up to Resilience. I mean, it's totally free. No paywall. And it's an excellent website anyway. So, uh, But we're going to read part one and about half of part two of this three-part uh, essay by William Reese titled On Being a Snowflake in an Avalanche, the Catastrophe of Overshoot and How to Cope. We might revisit the How to Cope advice from uh, William Reese later in the week, but uh, we're going to lead up and you can figure out for yourself how to cope. Okay, take it away William Reese. This article is divided into three parts. Part one is the scene setter, a rundown of humanity's overshoot predicament and how we got into it which I will read all of. Part 2 chronicles my career-long response to understanding Overshoot from an ecological perspective. We're going to read about half of that. And if you're still with me for Part 3, I share a few lessons learned and offer some advice for coping with the challenge of both knowing about and experiencing the consequences of overshoot. And as I say, we might get back to that later this week. But anyway, how did we get here? Some history of humanity's overshoot predicament. 
Over a decade ago, one of the most comprehensive assessments of global climate to date showed that the mean global temperature for the first decades of this century was approaching the highest levels in the past 11,000 years. A more recent article suggests that temperatures in the early 2020s are actually unprecedented in the past 24 thousand years, and that the magnitude and rate of heating over the last 150 years far exceeds the magnitude and rates Earth has experienced over the entire 24 millennia period. It is no surprise then that the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, otherwise known as NOAA, recently declared 2023 to be the warmest year in the instrumental record and that Antarctic sea ice coverage had dropped to a record low. And uh, he has, good Lord, how many links to all of these other uh, articles and uh, papers and studies. You, you could spend a year just clicking on the links. The beat go goes on. Yes, it does, William. The beat goes on. The most recent data available show January, February, and March 2020, 20, 2024 to be the hottest January, February, and March on record. Just the latest in a series of 10. Looking ahead, our current policy track would result in more or less 2.7 degrees Celsius mean global warming by century's end, and one credible study argues that with fast and slow feedbacks, even current atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations are sufficient to generate 10 degrees C heating, but even 2.7 degrees warming is sufficient to flatten agriculture in many areas and render large areas of Earth uninhabitable. Analysis shows under a range of warming scenarios that the projected geographical shift in the normal human temperature niche by 2100 would force the unprecedented migration of one to three billion people to thermally safer parts of the planet. Picture the abandonment of major cities and megacities, the invasion of rural areas by desperate millions, and an ungovernable world in geopolitical turmoil. There you go. Sounds like a pretty uh, accurate picture of the next few decades to me, brother. Uh, and that is just from global heating. Alarming as these data are, global heating is only the most palpable symptom of climate change, which is itself only one co-symptom of a much greater meta-problem, ecological overshoot. Overshoot means that humans are consuming even self-producing resources, e.g. fish stocks and forests, and replenishable resources, e.g. freshwater aquifers and arable soils, faster than they can regenerate and producing often toxic waste in excess of nature's assimilation capacity. Think about that for a moment, which of course 99.99% uh, .99 of the planet have never thought about that for one moment, never will think about it for one moment and the vast majority of the people who do think about it for one moment, I'll talk about, okay, Doomer. Anyway, think about 
that for a moment. You should soon realize that virtually all so-called environmental problems are actually caused by overshoot. Even anthropogenic climate change is an excess waste problem. Carbon dioxide is the greatest waste product by weight of industrial activity. <clears throat> the numerous other co-symptoms of overshoot include plunging biodiversity, fisheries collapses, tropical deforestation, land and soil degradation, groundwater depletion, rising cancer rates, falling sperm counts. Well, you know, there is some benefit to overshoot, which of course is falling sperm counts, but of course the sperm counts are falling uh, for every other species other than humans. Contaminated food change, the pollution of everything. There you go. Etc. Etc. Most of which are worsening with each new assessment. It should be clear from this dismal accounting that, left unattended, as it will be, overshoot is a terminal condition. The depletion and pollution of the ecosphere is a genuine existential threat, not only to human, quote, civilization, but also to the existence of thousands of other species with whom we share this planet. It is therefore a supreme irony that everything the world community is doing to address global heating, switching to wind and solar uh, electricity, promoting dubious CO2 extraction technologies, subsidizing electric vehicles, etc., is not only not fixing the climate, but is actually worsening overshoot. Fossil fuel use is still increasing, and carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions rise to new records annually, yet we remain in effective policy paralysis. How stupid is that? This is not just a facetious question. Homo sapiens is actually a much duller blade than most people can imagine. The ecological crisis is hardly breaking news. The road to overshoot is potholed with cogent warnings. Ra Rachel Carson's classic Silence, Silent Spring, sometimes credited with catalyzing the environmental movement and an unprecedented raft of environmental legislation, was published in 1962. And uh, I guess Bill's not aware of our plundered planet which was published in 1948, which was actually our plundered planet written in 1948. I'm sorry, I cannot remember the author of that. Uh, was the, you know, the, an absolute perfect explanation of ecological overshoot. Uh, you know, written 14 years before Silent Spring, but anyway, getting off track. Uh, a decade later, the 1962, and over half a century ago, the Club of Rome's infamous limits to growth projected already existing trends to show that pollution and resource scarcity could lead to global economic and population collapse in the mid-21st century. And I'm going to inject here that keep in mind that the limits to growth virtually did not even mention 
climate change, global heating and climate change was not even factored into their equations. Uh, and of course, William Catton's unsurpassed classic, Overshoot, appeared in 1982. The Union of Concerned Scientists published the first of many World Scientist Warnings to Humanity in 1992, arguing that humans are so altering the living world that it may soon be able to sustain, be unable to sustain life as we know it. Significantly, 1992 is also the year in which the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was adopted. Yes, it came into effect two years later with 165 signatories and 198 parties. In addition, corporate interest and environmental organizations participate as advisors, yes, and observers. Nation states agreed to return, this was in 1994, that uh, nation states then agreed to return their greenhouse gas emissions to 1990 levels by 2000. Towards this end, the convention's decision-making body, the Conference of the Parties, otherwise known as COP, has held 28 so-called COP conferences, the most recent in Dubai in 2023, on measures to reduce emissions and reverse climate change through decisive action. Yes. The first more or less, and I would say less, universal, quote, legally binding, there is absolutely nothing legally binding about it, global climate agreement was adopted at COP21 in Paris in 2015 with the parties committing to limit global heating to 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels while striving to keep the increase to one and a half degrees or less. Yes. Simultaneously, climate concern combined with the rising cost of fossil fuels and massive subsidies from governments catalyzed the emergence of a whole new, quote, clean energy sector. In recent years, investment in wind turbines, solar panel installations, nuclear plants, clean grid improvements, electric vehicles, and related infrastructure, can you say power lines, has been breathtaking, surpassing investment in fossil fuels and reaching $1.7 trillion dollars last year. One encouraging seminal review shows that since the mid-2000s, a large and growing number of research groups have concluded that 100% renewable energy, quote, is feasible worldwide at low cost, close quote. The public is, the public are enthusiastic supporters. You know, can you say the little limp dick lefty greenies? That public, the uh, ones cheering on Kamala Harris. Uh, the public are enthusiastic supporters, having been convinced by such studies and relentless industry promotion that a painless and economically attractive transition from fossil fuels to, quote, green renewable energy is already well underway. What's not to like? Well, plenty as it turns out. During this 32-year period of solemn pledges, binding agreements, 
and, poli and policy action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, carbon dioxide emissions actually ballooned from 22.5 billion tons in 1992 to 37.2 gigatons in 2023. And atmospheric carbon dioxide levels increased from 360 to 420 parts per million, i.e. to 50% above pre-industrial levels. In addition, a third of carbon emissions is dissolved in the seas, causing ocean acidification. Perhaps most remarkably, in 1992, fossil fuels provided about 81% of the primary energy. 32 years of progress later, fossil fuels now account for 80 2% of consumption. It may seem beyond belief, but half the fossil fuels ever consumed by humanity have been burned since 1990, such as the power of exponential growth. But what about that massive investment in clean electricity? The positive effect on emissions has largely been neutered by increasing global demand for energy. Wind and solar power, where most investment is going, accounted for only 14.3% of global electricity production in 2023 compared to about 60% by fossil fuels. In short, despite the promotional hype, billions invested and in rapid capacity growth, wind and solar electricity contributed only about 2.7% to the world's final consumer level energy consumption last year. The global community would have to install over four times the current multi-decade cumulative global stock of wind and solar infrastructure to fully displace fossil fuels from electricity generation alone, and this assumes no increase in demand. Problem solved? Not quite. We would still have to address the non-electric and hard to electrify uses of energy. As noted, fossil fuels are holding steady at over 80% of the global energy mix. These data from the real world suggests that the clean energy transition is actually barely underway. There is no possibility that we will achieve quantitatively equivalent, quote, 100% renewable energy by 2050. And if we try, note that the mining, transportation, refining, manufacturing, installation, maintenance, and replacement associated with wind and solar is powered mainly by fossil fuels and produces major collateral ecological damage. This is why the stricter Paris goal of limiting global warming to one and a half C is already in the rear view mirror and Earth will likely experience 2 degrees C heating by 2050, well on the way to, well, who knows? Should we be surprised? Not really. After all, the renewable energy transition is being sold partly on grounds that it involves massive capital investment, promises excellent 
profit-making opportunities and creates thousands of jobs. The reality is that the much vaunted green energy revolution is really an attempt to maintain the market-based capitalist status quo. At best, it is business as usual by alternative means when the growth oriented status quo is the structural source of the problem. It is no coincidence then that since the entire mythic Limit Global Warming show debuted in 1992, the two signature drivers of Overshoot, real gross world product and the human population have increased nearly fourfold and 45% respectively. We can safely conclude that the world community's singular focus on climate change has served as a, mis a major distraction from the real existential threat, the worsening meta problem of global overshoot. To repeat, how stupid is that? And, uh, well, guys, I was going to read some of part two, my response over a career as an academic ecologist, uh, but I'm, um, uh, Okay. Uh, am I going to read? Let's read. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and uh, read uh, some of this. He, you know, he talks about uh, how he's just been completely tuned out and maligned and ad hominem attacked uh, by all of these economists and clueless morons telling William Reese he has no clue what he's talking about. Uh, we'll pick up there. The intellectual slagging, the intellectual slagging gets worse. Anyone who attempts to associate, in fact, Anyone who attempts to associate the contribution of growing populations to the human eco-predicament will need to develop a certain intellectual, intellectual insouciance to direct ad hominem attacks for frequent repetition of this sin I have repeatedly been characterized in social media as anti-human, eco-fascist, and racist. Neo-Malthusian is perhaps the mildest of such negative epithets, the one I am happy to accept. In a recent widely read paper, my co-author and I used the context of global overshoot to critique the so-called energy transition in Green New Deal thinking. I might get to this uh, paper at some point in the near future. The reaction from renewable energy proponents was swift and intemperate. The journal's editor was so cowed that he published an, ap an apology for allowing my paper through the peer review process. We were actually well reviewed. The editor seemed particularly exercised because we had argued that the world community should consider a controlled downsizing and we had the temerity to suggest setting, quote, a limit to the world population so as to avoid overshoot. 
an unfortunate echo of Malthusianism that is surely not even conceivable today. Close quote. Well, didn't those words come back to bite him in the ass? What I find not conceivable today is that any even half-informed person cannot recognize limits the reality of overshoot and the, and the possible implosion of the ecosphere. It should also be clear that the only effective solutions will entail planned absolute reductions in economic throughput can you say energy, material consumption, and waste production, and smaller populations. In short, overshoot and its various symptoms cannot be resolved without major economic restructuring, significant changes to high-income lifestyles, and global population planning. And these are all reasons why, as I put in that little clip yesterday, it ain't going to happen. As Bill Reese knows and is on record, it ain't going to happen. Perhaps for some, fear of the inevitable is negated by belief that humans are destined to abandon a shriveled earth and populate the galaxy. Or perhaps we will upload our minds and consciousness to some universal, universal computer, digital immortality forever, freeing us from the messiness of corporeal existence. Others take comfort in, or even welcome, the prophesized biblical end times and their ascent into heaven. Good luck with that. On one hand, I sympathize. There is good reason to fear. The modern human enterprise is utterly dependent on abundant energy, and this creates a double-barreled dilemma. Simply stopping fossil fuels without an adequate substitute would collapse the economy, i.e. modern civilization. On the other hand, continuing our use of fossil fuels risks the wrath of climate change, worsening overshoot, and will likely collapse the ecosphere and the economy, i.e. modern civilization. Sometimes, when contemplating this dilemma, I see the human enterprise as a monster avalanche, and each of us little more than incorporated, even willfully participating snowflakes. We are simply swept along in the furious deluge, our best efforts useless in slowing its gathering momentum. Frankly, it is increasingly evident, to me at least, that we are innately incapable of comprehending the full scope of our predicament, let alone controlling how things unravel. And there you go. But then uh, William Reese is, is really going to scrape and try to come up with some hopium. Uh, but we will save that. Perhaps we will save William Reese uh, for, for the ain't going to happen roundup on Friday when uh, William Reese... Uh, who I think is now, is he 80 or 81 years old, shares some lessons learned and advice for carrying on. But uh, as I say, uh, I will see if I uh, 
have time for that and the ain't gonna happen round up on Friday but right now looks like the storm clouds are gathering so I need to gather my uh, mountain of laundry and head to the laundromat on this gloomy Sunday afternoon while I still can. Bye guys.